Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. This, I believe, is the last Grand Rounds of 2017. So thank you for being here. I want to celebrate again our trainees who went through match day uh, recently to decide where they were going. And we learned that many of them are going all over the place to expand their training or to develop uh, new careers. NYU, Vanderbilt, UCLA, uh, Baylor, and, and much more. So we're really proud of our trainees, but we're also very grateful and proud to our faculty and our staff who do a lot of work day in and day out to make sure they do well, that they become excellent physicians, but they also do well during interview season and understand how the process goes. There's a strategy to that. So I thank you all for that. And when you see them, celebrate them in the hallway, because uh, that's an important uh, accomplishment for them. We also want to remind you about a few people who made a difference in our understanding of biology or medicine. And so I want to start with Robert Brown. Robert Brown was born on this day back in 1773. He's a Scottish botanist, very well known as a plant physiologist, but you know him because he was the first to notice the continuous movement of minute particles in colloidal solutions. He published this in 1828. You know it as Brownian movement. Robert Brown, born on this day. About 32 years later was the birth of Thomas Graham. Thomas Graham was born on this day in 1805, Scottish uh, physical chemist who was considered the father of colloid chemistry. He was the first to study the diffusion of gases back and forth, gases into liquid, and then he got into liquid, into liquid. And uh, he classified crystalloids into that versus uh, colloids, and he sort of became this, began the colloid chemistry area. He also developed dialysis, which is an interesting point today. He developed dialysis to separate colloidal solutions from electrolytes. James Parkinson was uh, born in 1700s. He died on this day in 1824, and he described the neuro dis neuromuscular disease that we know today that carries his name in an essay called The Essay on the Shaking Palsy, an essay on the shaking palsy back in 1817. Edwin Krebs, who won the Nobel Prize uh, in 1992 for the discovery of reversible phosphorylation, important signal transduction mechanism. Uh, died on this day back in 2009 at age 91. He shared the Nobel Prize with uh, Edmund Fisher. And I want to finish with George Warren Fuller, F-U-L-L-E-R. Now, he's not the traditional person I mentioned up here. He was an American engineer, but you'll see why I mention him. He was uh, an, a pioneer in the area of purification of water for drinking. And he spent a lot of time at MIT in training. He also worked there for a while. He worked five years as on the Massachusetts Board of Health. He was very intrigued about this concept of this new area of public health and how water was so relevant to public health. So in 1895, he spent time in Louisville, Kentucky. And he was here at the experimental station at Louisville, Kentucky, studying water rapid filtration. Mm -hmm. And he was the first in the United States to conduct studies about purification of water using chlorine gas to purify the Ohio River water. So with that, I'll leave you with Eleanor Letterer, the Chief of Nephrology and Interim Chair of the Department of Medicine, to introduce our guest of the day. He's not a guest. He's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, it, it's certainly, um, you know, a pleasure for me to introduce one of my favorite people in the world, seriously, uh, Mike Breyer, who is one of the members of my division who's actually been here for longer than I've been here. Um, Mike uh, graduated from Purdue with a PhD in industrial pharmacy um, and joined George Aronoff um, up at IU in doing studies looking at salt metabolism and salt homeostasis and how this relates to hypertension. He came down here with uh, George when George became uh, the division chief and actually maintained his re uh, basic science research career looking at whole kidney handling um, of sodium. However, as happens to many of us, his career evolved um, and he became increasingly uh, interested in 
human-based research and actually at this point is the, the head of our clinical research uh, division. Um, he has been the uh, PI on a large number of uh, trials here that have been sponsored by uh, industry um, and pharmaceutical companies. Um, he has also helped numerous uh, residents, faculty, and students in completing uh, a, a bunch of human-based uh, research uh, projects. I'm sure that many of you in the audience um, um, have had familiar with that, are familiar with that. Now, one of the projects that he worked on with George was uh, George's project that, that he spearheaded with Bill Bennett from Oregon, which was looking at uh, drug dosing in kidney failure, and they published the first book that many of us ended up carrying around in our pocket for years. Um, Mike has maintained this interest in looking at how kidney disease alters the metabolism and the handling of drugs, and today he's here to give us an update um, on that topic. Mike? Good morning, and, and thank you for that introduction. I learned some things about myself. Uh, I did do some work with uh, Fred Luff on, on salt metabolism, and he just published uh, two papers in uh, Journal of Clinical Investigation showing uh, some interesting results on sodium, uh, the skin's a depot for sodium, uh, and so uh, it is kind of coming a little bit of a full circle. Um, imagine my excitement when I found out that nephrology was given this lecture thing. <laughs> Okay, it's, it's the winter solstice. So one can look at it two ways. We can look at it, this is the light at the end of the tunnel, that I am a good thing, or that this is the most depressing day in the world, and we're going to talk about some things that you may find depressing as well. You'll uh, tell me at the end what you think about that. Uh, my research has been um, pub, um, funded by the Department of Veterans Affairs and the NIH, and I have some uh, com commitments to industry and we have a patent that was uh, licensed to the company called Dosis Inc. Um, so two weeks ago, I was in Cancun, Mexico, and I think this is a much better picture of me than the one you have on your, on your uh, announcement. Uh, as uh, Eleanor said, I want to thank George Aronoff, who spent 30 years of his life trying to figure, teach me how to do clinical research and what's the importance of the work that I do. Bill Bennett is a former president of the ASN, and uh, in 1970 published the first compilation on drug dosing and kidney disease. Bruce Mueller is a professor at the University of Michigan. Fortunately, I didn't go to Ohio State, so I don't have to hate him. Um, and uh, they all contributed to this talk. Bill Bennett and Bruce Mueller gave me some of the uh, case, cases that I'm going to show today. So the first thing I want to do is I want to, I'm going to talk about creatinine. This is our, uh, uh, our biomarker. Uh, it's been used for over 100 years to talk about kidney function. Uh, I'm going to spend about 10 slides talking about glomerular filtration rate and how we determine renal dysfunction. Then I'm going to talk to you about uh, pharmacokinetics. So I was a TA at Purdue University, and the pharmacy students loved that course. They loved it so much that they never talked to me again. Um, I also want to talk about how we can understand what renal function is doing during acute kidney injury because that's a topic that is really not worked on very well. And then the impact of chronic kidney disease on drug dosing. So as Jesse likes, here's our first case uh, provided by Bruce Mueller. A 60-year-old 80-kilogram male presents to the emergency department with altered mental status. He's febrile, has a heart rate of 115, respiratory rate of 23, blood pressure of 90 over 60. His white cell count is 14.5. His serum creatinine is 1.8 with an estimated GFR of 41. BUN 25. While in the emergency department, his respiratory function decreased and was intubated. I don't see Forrest. Oh, there he is. He's not in his normal spot. So Forrest, I prepped you with uh, the fact that I was going to have a case for you to think about. So during the next 24 hours, vital signs have not improved. Patient has a positive fluid balance. White blood cell count is increasing. Cultures are pending. ID was consulted and determines that the patient likely has at least one antibiotic-resistant organism. This is what I was told, Forrest. I don't know how you know that, but uh, we'll, we'll go on. Uh, and nephrologists can consulted to discuss starting renal replacement therapy. So we have a few questions. What antibiotic are we going to use? And uh, at the end of the talk, I'll, Forrest is going to tell me what he would do. 
uh, what regimen, dose and interval, what form of renal replacement therapy, Chip Jacobs is back in the corner, he's our director of the acute dialysis unit over here, so he's going to tell me what we're going to do there. Uh, does renal failure affect drug and regimen selection? And does the form of renal replacement therapy affect dose and selection? So by the end of this talk, I think we should be able to answer most of those questions. So once again, uh, let's talk about uh, estimating renal function. So uh, what we have is basically a pyramid. We're interested in determining what the glomerular filtration rate, and we have one thing. We have serum creatinine. Now we could take the serum creatinine and we could do a 24-hour creatinine clearance, and that would be an estimate of, of renal function. It's problematic. When was the last time anybody actually ordered a 24-hour creatinine clearance? Raise your hands. Okay, I've got two people. And it's not surprising that one's Eleanor and the other one's Don Caster. So I am not surprised by that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try and figure out how this pyramid works and what we can do. So uh, in uh, Jesse's tradition, I always like to talk about history as well. So creatinine was discovered in 1847, and it was done, found by heating meat. And they, d they saw that it created uh, creatinine. In 1914, these authors did a study on themselves and probably their medical students, which we're not allowed to do anymore. Darn. Uh, and they found that the kidneys removed creatinine from the blood with remarkable ease and certainty. They obviously spoke better than I did back in 1914. Uh, and then uh, Reinberg suggested that creatinine was filtered by the glomeruli in 1929. And so we had it set up that we have, nephrology has had a biomarker for over 100 years of what we can do, well, how to estimate renal function. And so we, we've been blessed in a, in a number of ways there. Uh, creatinine is generated from muscle breakdown, it's freely filtered by the glomeruli, and it's secreted. In cases where urine flow is very low, you can have some reabsorption, and there is a minuscule amount of re extra renal secretion into the, into the gut. So here's my drawing of a glomeruli, and uh, Viv and Nyack criticized me, saying that this should be round, but uh, it's a bad slice. Pathologist got a bad slice, so it's not really round. So we have creatinine in the afferent arterial. It's freely filtered at the glomeruli and enters the proximal tubule. The efferent arterial comes along next to the proximal tubule, and creatinine is actually uh, excreted by both the anion, uh, organic anion transporters and cation transporters in the proximal tubules, where the multi-drug uh, transporters then uh, send it to the urine. So that's how creatinine is secreted. And so it can be set up for some interactions here at this site. And on this slide, we show some of the drugs that interfere with uh, creatinine secretion. And therefore, if you're on cymetidine, for instance, in a high dose, your creatinine will go up, but your renal function has not changed. So with these, with these drugs, creatinine, uh, serum creatinine can go up. With these drugs, they interfere with the assay. The serum creatinine doesn't actually increase, but the drugs cause a, 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 an, a, an increase in the assay. Finally, ACEs and ARBs will increase the serum creatinine, but this is the actual decrease in GFR. And if that's greater than 15%, then uh, you need to reconsider using those ACE and ARBs. So if you put somebody on an ACE and ARB, you can expect that the creatinine's going to go up. Uh, it's just you don't want it to go up too high. So if you look at uh, creatinine clearance, what's the contribution of secretion to overall clearance? In Patients with normal renal function, secretion is about 15 to 20%. In patients that have severely decreased renal function, it increases to about 40%. I don't know what it is in between here. So back in the 70s when we were watching the moon uh, launch and all, they always had simulations and artist conception. So this is my artist conception. I don't know what's going on here, but I know that it goes from this point to this point, And it's probably not linear. What we can do is we can use exogenous substances uh, to uh, measure GFR. What we used to use in the pharmacokinetic studies was inulin. It's uh, derived from plant, and uh, it's very rare to find anymore. So they typically don't use inulin anymore. They use uh, iohexol, or iothalamate is probably the more popular one. And J. Alsoskis uh, uh, gave me an example yesterday of a patient that he used iothalamate on. I don't think that people do that very uh, routinely for clinical purposes, but it certainly is available for that, for that uh, endeavor. So what we did was, well, not me, this, this guy, Levy, who's published about 40 papers on serum creatinine, 
uh, he did a study in the uh, modification of diet and renal disease study. They measured their GFR using one of the exogenous agents. They compared it to the serum creatinine, and they looked at a group of patients that had a GFR of about 40, and they came up with a uh, regression equation that then predicts the uh, relationship between serum creatinine and, and estimated GFR, and that's what's printed out on your lab form from the, the, from, the, from the laboratory here. You'll get a serum creatinine, and it'll say estimated GFR for a Caucasian and an African American, and that's where that comes from. And here's the data. So what you see here is the measured GFR minus the estimated GFR versus the estimated GFR using the MDRD, right? So if it, for instance, if the estimate, if you have a serum creatinine and the serum creatinine becomes estimated by this line to be 60, in actuality, your patient could be somewhere between minus 15 and plus 30. So there's quite a bit of variability involved in that, but this is what we have, and this is what you're, what you're getting. And it's not so much that... Um, the point estimate is a problem. It's what we want to do is we want to do serial estimates because in a serial environment, you'll know exactly what's going on with that patient. It's maybe not so important that the patient's 60, but you need to know if it's changing, if it's going down. So what factors can influence the serum creatinine? Older age, female sex, restriction of dietary protein, and malnutrition, muscle wasting, and amputation decrease the serum creatinine due to decreased generation of the muscle. African-American race, ingestion of cooked meats results in a transient increase, and muscular body habitus. And so Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Thurmanator, he'll have a higher serum creatinine because he has higher creatinine production. Importantly, in Kentucky, obesity has no change in serum creatinine. So let's go back to our little diagram again. And uh, we're trying to go from serum creatinine to GFR. Um, we already saw that there are only two people in this audience of 5,432 people that did a 24-hour creatinine clearance. We don't really do uh, exogenous compounds except in very rare cases. So what we do is we take the serum creatinine. We use either the MDRD or the CKD epi uh, equation, which I uh, didn't talk about, and we estimate GFR in that way, and it works out pretty well. So now let's talk about pharmacokinetics. These little guys right here, are like the Yorkies of the reef. They are very territorial and they'll beat up on anybody. So I was kind of afraid to get too close to them during the dive. So let's see, pharmacokinetics is the study of the passage of the drug through the body. We first start with the drug coming in either through oral absorption or parental administration. It gets into the systemic circulation. If it goes through the liver, we have to worry about first pass effect. Drug then dis, uh, distributes to tissue sites and then is eliminated by the kidney or the liver. Metabolism here, there can be metabolism in the kidney or, or excretion. And so let's go through each one of these areas and talk about how uh, kidney disease impacts them. So when a new drug comes to market, it's required by the pharmaceutical industry to determine what's the, the best dose to cause efficacy. And so here we can see kind of a simulation of a drug that we're giving orally and it's well within the uh, efficacy range. Then the patient gets uh, renal disease. What happens with that? Well, that um, uh, concentration then moves up into the toxic range, and we have to do some kind of dose uh, adjustment. So how do we go about doing that, and how do we understand what's going on there? So from the standpoint of pharmacokinetics, we talk about it as the ADME uh, processes, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. And we're going to go through each one of these in turn and talk about how kidney failure uh, impacts them. So the first thing is absorption or bioavailability. So absorption, so as we already talked about, intravenous drugs enter the circulation directly, so we don't really talk about absorption. But does anybody know what organ, if you give a bolus into somebody's antecubital vein, what organ first gets hit with that bolus? the heart, and the lung. So lung has large surface area, large capillary. So if there is lung metabolism of the drug, there actually can be first pass effect in that, in that, in that instance, but uh, I don't know of any specific instance. Oral drugs are subject, uh, oral administration is subject to change in the uh, absorption. So the gastrointestinal systems are common in urea. 
uremia, uh, they have delayed gastric emptying, and they have slow GI motility. So these same, same things can be said for the diabetics and endocrinology. So these patients will exert, uh, uh, have the same, the same symptoms. Gastric alkalization use of the saliva and urea may decrease absorption of drugs requiring an acidic environment. So uh, as the patients swallow saliva, urea goes to the stomach and changes the pH. Uh, we give patients phosphate binders. So they, can, they obviously bind up phosphate, but they can bind drugs. So if you're going to give a binder or you're going to give an antacid, you should probably give it at a different time than when the drug is unless uh, it's been studied. And there will be changes in first pass effects, which is uh, kind of a new area that uh, people have ignored for a long time. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Here's a study of five different drugs and the effect of chronic renal failure on their bioavailability. So what they did was you give a drug orally and you give a drug intravenously and you compare the area into the curve of the drug concentration time trial between those two. And what you, what you can see is uh, when you do it in a normal page, uh, normal, uh, this was actually in, in rats, when you do it in a normal animal and you compare it to a chronic renal failure animal, you see the propranolol is increased 300%, erythromycin 100%, and, and these others as well. What we're seeing here is a, in, a decreased metabolism by the cytochrome P450 enzymes. Historically, at the FDA, they said, if a drug is metab uh, metabolized hepatically and not renally excreted, you are not required to do renal failure studies. The fact is that uh, renal failure affects metabolism, and we'll see that uh, when we talk about elimination as well. So even though you have a, um, a patient in a drug that's metab uh, hepatically metabolized, there can be effects on it outside of filtration changes. So in summary, the interactions of absorption and first pack effect, pass effect and hepatic metabolism are complex. Remember, when you give an oral drug, it has to, first it has to disintegrate, then it has to dis dissolve because it's only drug in solution. Then it goes into the stomach. There could be absorption there. Then it goes into the duodenum. And that's a complex process. When we model it, we give it one single rate constant. We call it Ka. Um, probably an oversimplification, but there are a lot of, uh, uh, of processes that we, we, we overlook. So now another case. So we have a 46-year-old male undergoing a de deceased donor renal transplant. The cold ischemia time of the donor kidney was 18 hours, and the patient has delayed graft function. Serum electrolytes are normal, BUN is 76, and his creatinine is 10.2. Serum albumin is 3.4. He receives basolectomab induction following mycophenolate multipel 1 gram BID, tacrolimus 3 milligrams BID, and tapering doses of prednisone. He received 30 milligrams of prednisone yesterday, and on post-op day 7, he has developed severe diarrhea. The most likely cause of his diarrhea is A, increased serum mycophenic acid concentrations due to renal dysfunction, increased mycophenolic acid concentrations due to hypoalbuminuria. His, his albumin is 3.4. Is that, is that low? Low range of normal or normal? For a dialysis patient, it's pretty typical. Uh, free, uh, former dialysis patient, this is a transplant. Free mycophenolic acid concentrations due to increased plasma protein binding, decreased plasma protein binding, interaction between tacrolimus and mycophenolic multipel, or C. diff. Forrest, does he have C. diff? It's, okay, so well, it's probably not E. So the answer is actually C. John? C. Diff. Eleanor says a lot. So the answer is C. So it's a protein binding effect. So Protein binding affects distribution of drugs. And so the next thing we're going to talk about is distribution in these patients. So the first concept that we have to talk about, and I'm sure you all love this from the two days that you received in pharmacology lecture, um, the volume of distribution is really just a fudge factor. We give amounts of drugs to patients. We measure concentrations. How do we reconcile those two? And that's called the volume of distribution. And so it's just the amount of drug in the body divided by the plasma concentration, and it's a theoretical volume, usually. 
uh, it's not an anatomical space unless the drug is distributed only in the vasculature. It's, it's, it's make-believe. It can be, um, it doesn't represent a volume per se, but because we uh, use that to do, when we do the, um, uh, um, when we check units, we have to have a volume term in there for the units to, to work out. It's not constant, it can be dose dependent. It can be dependent on the volume status. If we have a small volume of distribution patient and you have somebody that has edema, the volume of distribution will be affected. And it's definitely affected by protein binding. So when we give a drug, it enters the systemic circulation and it first moves into the extracellular fluid space and it may or may not go into the intracellular fluid space or it may or may not go into the lipid bilayer depending on the uh, uh, charge of the drug and its lipid felicity. Ultimately, it gets to the receptor where, receptor where we have uh, uh, the site of action and it could go into uh, special compartments like LSD and body fat, right? LSD ends up in your body fat and you can have, I, I've, told, I've been told this, I don't have any first-hand knowledge. So there are special compartments that drug can distribute to. And so uh, when we have renal dysfunction, we have an alteration in protein binding Drugs move this way. And so going back to our case, here's a study that looked at normal patients, and the Michael, uh, mycophenolate mofetil, and they compared it to uremic patients, and this is the fraction-free. And the fraction-free is the part of the drug that is distributed and has action. So when you have a change in protein binding where the fraction-free increases twofold, at the receptor, the concentrations have increased twofold, and you now could have toxicity, and this is the reason that this patient had diarrhea, because of a change in protein binding. This is common in patients with renal dysfunction. So in summary, in distribution, remember, uh, edema and ascites can increase the volume of distribution of the water-soluble components in highly protein-bound drugs, and so this isn't necessarily only related to uh, nephrology patients. This could be your cardiac patients with congestive heart failure or your liver patients that have uh, uh, liver disease. Dehydration and muscle wasting may decrease volume and distribution, but probably the biggest effect we see is changes in plasma protein binding, increasing volume and distribution. This is likely due to a, a decrease in infinite, uh, affinity. We saw a patient, the patient had an uh, albumin of 3.4, so it wasn't that low. So it doesn't describe those, those effects. Or it could be a decrease in pro protein concentration. So volume of distribution uh, impacted by protein binding. So now it's case three. You are evaluating a patient with five, stage five CKD on long-term hemodialysis. His medication list includes two hepatically mat uh, metabolized antidepressant medications plus a narcotic analgesic. All of these drugs are metabolized by the liver via cytochrome P450, excuse me, 3A, enzymes to more water-soluble metabolites. The, the body's goal is to take foreign agents and metabolize them to more polar agents so the kidney can get rid of them. So uh, th that's, that's, that's just what it does. And so when we talk about um, drugs, we also have to think about the metabolites because the kidney is not removing them either when, that's, when we have that problem. So the patient's wife reports increased strange behavior, not uncommon in my family, with episodes that result in loss of consciousness. No seizure activity has been observed. Aside from the drugs mentioned above, the patient has phosphate binders, vitamin D receptor antagonists, and an ACE inhibitor for blood pressure control. The most likely cause of his episodes are antihypertensive drug interference with hepatic metabolism, accumulation of parent drug due to chronic renal disease, inadequate dialysis of narcotic and antidepressant medication, accumulation of drug metabolites with adverse CNS consequences, or depression of cytochrome P450 metabolism by chronic kidney disease. So this is one of these questions that Bill Bennett uses in the uh, course that he teaches on on this topic for the board review course for the nephrology fellows. And so uh, there's a lot of these things that are true, but the big answer is D. We have accumulation of these active or toxic metabolites in patients with kidney disease. So not only do we have to worry about um, the, the parent drug, but in a patient on dialysis, we have vast accumulations of these, uh, of these um, uh, metabolites. 
And uh, the first instance that I know about it was the, uh, patients that received uh, diazepam, so whatever that real name is. Uh, patient on dialysis will enter into a coma because of the accumulation of those, of those toxic metabolites. And so we now know not to do that. So now let's talk about metabolism. So what we do is we start with the kidney because everything resolves around the kidney. The owner tells me that daily. So uh, we have a decreased clearance, which is uh, uh, manifested by a decrease in GFR. We can have decreased in secretion. We then have the accumulation of uremic toxins. So um, the magic bullet in nephrology is to find out what these uremic toxins are, and it's never been done. So there's a lot of things that accumulate. It's kind of like uh, herbal tea, right? It has 5,000 different ingredients. We don't know which one's the, be the benefit. But uh, we, we have this problem. These accumulation of these toxins leads to increased cytokines and chronic inflammation. And so going to Craig's uh, talk last week, and he talked about cytokines in the liver. We know that cytokines are important there. And what happens is we have reduced clearance at the liver. We have decreased uh, cytochrome P450 activity. We have up, decrease in uptakes using uh, different transporters. We have changes in the intestines, intestines, all due to this chronic inflammation. So here we go with different drugs. At the effect of chronic renal failure on non-renal clearances. So when, we, when we, we measure clearance in a patient, we have total body clearance. And that's how much the body is eliminating the drug at one point in time. If we measure how much is coming out in the urine as an amount, we then know what the renal clearance is. Everything else is called non-renal clearance. And it's typically metabolism. So all of these drugs have a decreased clearance of the drug because of chronic renal failure and it impacts these enzyme systems, primarily the cytochrome P450, but also other ones. And these metabolic processes are all impacted. And so I made this comment before. The FDA pretty much ignores this, this effect and doesn't require any studies to, to, to look at this. And so it's not until we see something bad happen that we then go in and study those things. Um, so there could be uh, room for improvement in that area. So in summary, both the liver and kidney metabolism of drugs can, be, can change with decreasing renal function. Changes are real and clinically significant, despite what was previously reported. Mechanisms likely due to circulating uh, inhibitory factors. Drug transporters are also likely affected. And changes in protein binding could lead to increased free fraction and enhanced clearance. So we talked about uh, protein binding affecting uh, distribution, but the drug that is metabolized by these is only the free fraction, unless the extraction. Uh, so this is, this is where it gets a little complicated. So if you have an organ that's removing an agent, and you look at the arterial side versus the venous side, and you calculate the extraction ratio, right, just as a ratio of those, if that ratio is close to one, protein binding is not important. But if the extraction ratio is probably, much, you know, 50% or so, then protein binding is, is important. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit later when we talk about elimination. So case four. You are prescribing an antibiotic for a patient with stage four CKD. Stage four CKD is about uh, uh, 10 to 15, GFR 10 to 15, pardon me? 15 to 30. You know that the drug is 98% excreted by the kidney with trivial extra renal metabolism. When the drug accumulates in the body, neurologic toxicity can ensure, ensue. To ensure safety in prescribing this drug, you would, okay, so now we're going to go to the, the options. Now remember, I'm a mathematician, and I look at things from that standpoint. Bill Bennett is a country nephrologist. And so some of these answers that he's given, I would disagree with, but these are what he's told us. Start to gradually dose reduction at stage 2 CKD. Adjust downward, dose downward by 50% if the serum creatinine is twice normal. Reduce dosage at a level of kidney function where drug accumulation is occurring. Measure creatinine clearance and decrease drug proportionally to the decrease in creatinine clearance. Do not adjust drug dosage until a side effect occurs. Okay, who likes E? Oh, shoot. 
So Bill would say answer C, which was uh, decrease the drug when drug accumulation uh, occurs. So I'm going to, so I, I was at, I was taking a class. And the question on the test was, um, when you're two pH factors away from the pKa of a drug, how much of that drug, is, is that drug, um, does it have a charge or no charge? And I, and I thought, you always have a little bit of drug that will have a charge, no matter how far away you are from the pK, right? So my answer was, yeah, it always has a charge. They thought the answer was no, because you're too, you know, you have 99% of the drug because of the log scale. Well, that's the same thing here. Drug clearance, if the GFR falls by 10% for a drug that's renally excreted, drug clearance falls by 10%. So the drug clearance is always changing. It just depends on the relationship of the uh, therapeutic range to the concentrations that you're observing. So if you have a drug that has a wide range, you don't have to make a drug a dose adjustment. What happens is that the majority of patients, you don't really see anything happening until about a GFR of 30. So you're really not required to make a change because of the large range of therapeutic, the large therapeutic index for drugs. So this is one of those qualitative, uh, qualitative rather than quantitative answers. So now let's talk about uh, elimination. This is a, a queen angel. And they're probably about the prettiest fish that you're going to see when you're scuba diving. And uh, I saw one during this whole trip. So uh, we, were, we were pretty lucky to see it. So elimination. So uh, elimination is just, the, the clearance is the amount is, is the volume of blood from which all drug is removed in unit time. So we have mils per minute, liters per hour. That's, that's a removal number. And that simply is blood flow times the extraction. That's clearance. Simple concept. How we calculate, it's a little bit more complicated at times. For filtration, it's the glomerular filtration rate times by the uh, extraction ratio. For secretion, it can be up to renal blood flow. So if you get a number that's much, uh, uh, for any organ, that the, you say the clearance is higher than renal blood flow, that is fake news. That's impossible. Can't happen. So we can look at these numbers, and we can say something about what's going on in the kidney without actually having to stick tubes into them and, 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 and do uh, manipulations in that way. So here's a drug vancomycin that people use quite a bit. And what they did was a study where they took a bunch of people that had different ranges of uh, uh, creatinine clearance in this case. This was back in the 80s when they used to do that kind of stuff. Disco and all that other good stuff. So um, you then measure the clearance of vancomycin and you plot it in a linear relationship and you see if there's something going on here. So as I, as I stated previously, if we, as we move, Every, every one mil decrease in GFR results in a 0.79 decrease in clearance. And so from this, we can get some information about how to do some dose adjustments. So from the package insert here, four patients with mild to moderate renal dysfunction. I like these, these, these uh, qualitative terms because they tell you nothing. Doesn't tell me what GFR. If my patient has a GFR 60, is that mild to moderate? I guess. Um, so the initial dose is 15 milligrams per kilogram once. Maintenance dose of 1.9 milligrams per kilogram every 24 hours. Sound right, Forrest? Okay, good. Right. For severe renal function dysfunction. Initial dose is the same, maintenance dose is the same, or you can give these other doses. For patients that have no renal function whatsoever, the initial dose is the same. So what's this telling us? The volume of distribution determines what the initial dose is. And the volume of distribution, if it doesn't change, that doesn't change. So the, the loading doses for drugs don't change necessarily with renal dysfunction. But the maintenance dose does. And you give it once every seven to 10 days. Does anybody know what the half-life of vancomycin is in patients with kidney dysfunction, with no renal function? It's four hours in normal patients. It's 200 to 250 hours in patients with decreased renal function, with, with no kidney function. Therefore, we have to 
extend the interval. Now, in practice, you may be doing something else. You do therapeutic drug monitoring, and that helps you quite a bit. So that, that, that is a, a saving grace. So for uh, elimination, renal excretion depends on filtration, secretion, and reabsorption. Filtration is dependent on molecular size, protein binding, and the extraction ratio. Secretion is uh, we have to worry about drug interactions. And we kind of, we take care of that in, with using probenicid in some cases. So in the 40s, it took 2,000 liters of, 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 of um, media to create enough penicillin to give one dose to a patient. So what they figured out is that they could prolong the, uh, uh, the eff efficacy by giving probenicid at the same time. They also collected all the urine, recrystallized the penicillin, and regave it. But that's probably something unrelated to what we're doing here. If the drug clearance is much greater than GFR, then you have net secretion. If drug clearance is less than GFR, you have net reabsorption. So, as I said at the beginning, today's the winter solstice. So if you go to Tulum, Mexico, which I happen to do, and you look right here when the sun comes up, the sun comes right through the middle of this, and that building is set up such that they could observe the winter solstice. And it does it on the, on the summer solstice as well. So what goes on in acute kidney failure? So um, everybody in this room, unless you have some kind of active uh, uh, changing renal function, has, is constantly creating creatinine at a constant rate, and it's being eliminated at a constant rate, such that your serum creatinine is stable. If you have somebody that, that has chronic kidney disease, the rate out, the, the rate in may be the same, but the rate out is, is less. And so what happens is the serum creatinine has to rise. What happens during acute kidney injury? So in acute kidney injury, the patient comes in and they have a normal serum creatinine, but all of a sudden their rate out changes. And over time, it's, it's increasing. So what are you going to do? If, uh, if creatinine is moving, how are you going to estimate renal function so you can do drug dosing? Some people don't pay any attention whatsoever. After today, you'll know. So here's the equation for the CKD epi. It just estimates GFR as a linear regression or a regression of, uh, of these agents, right? So it looks at serum creatinine, it looks at age, it looks at female sex and black race. And it can determine the, the GFR from that information. If you take that equation and you solve it for a 60 year old, which some of us in this room are pretty close to by right now, you can see what happens. Here's the serum creatinine on this act, in this part, and this is what it would turn out for for the four different categories. And as you can see, uh, a person with a serum creatinine of one, depending on if they are white or black, male or female, can be 78, 52, 90, or 61. That's what the CKD epi is, right? I can take that and I can rearrange that equation, and I can get from it creatinine production per day. And that's what I've done here. So uh, a white male with a serum creatinine one has this much creatinine produced to, during the day. Black male has more, black female a little bit less, white female even less. So remember, determining what the serum creatinine is at any one time is dependent on production and elimination. So now I've tied down production, baseline production. So now I can look at the change in serum creatinine. And so, what I can do is, I can take this equation, and there will be a take-home quiz. Uh, and this, this just describes, the, this, is, uh, this is the equation for constant rate infusion. The, infusion. the substance being infused is creatinine. So I can calculate that. And then I can put in here the, the elimination rate constant is just the GFR divided by the volume distribution. So I know what the GFR is. I'm going to set that. I'm going to make that number up, and I'm going to see what happens to serum creatinine. And here's what happens to serum creatinine. So here's our patient, 60-year-old uh, white male, serum creatinine of 1, has an eGFR of 78 mils per minute from 1.73 meters squared. If their GFR drops from 78 to 45, you will not be able to detect that. The serum creatinine goes up so low that you really can't de detect that. And it does it within 24 hours. If the, creatinine, if the GFR goes to 30, you can detect that change, and you will know that in 24 hours that the patient has reached a new, a new baseline. If it goes to 15, 
it's going to take about, it's going to take at least 48 hours for you to see that, but you can see that in, in, immediately. Within 24 hours, when you have another serum creatinine measurement, you know it's going to change. If the patient's GFR goes to zero, it's just going to climb ad infinitum, right? So what I can do is I can take that information and I can create an omogram. And so this is uh, our future work. This is what I'm interested in doing now. Um, and I, I want to really nail down what to do during AKI because nobody's ex, uh, expanded upon this. And so uh, I got this idea while I was sitting in Grand Rounds one time. It was probably during one of Jesse's talks and I was bored. And I was thinking, what could, if I were to give Grand Rounds, what might be interesting? And so I, I actually thought about this during Grand Rounds. Um, so what you can see here, here's our patient at a serum creatinine of one. If their creatinine goes up by about 0.8 in 24 hours, their GFR is zero. Anything less than that, it's going to be, you know, uh, you, you'll fall in these other categories, but uh, as uh, Eleanor likes to do, I'm going to repeat myself. If their creatinine goes up by 0.8, they're a white male that's about 60, and it goes up by 0.8, it's zero. So that means that today the patient comes in, their creatinine's 1.0. You're on the critical care ward, you're rounding with Jesse, the, any of the trainees in the back, and the next day you measure a serum creatinine and it's 1.8, you're going to say, Dr. Roman, this patient has no renal function, we need to consult nephrology. No. No, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we all know what the surgeons would do. So and that's, uh, you know, one of the important take-home messages, I think, from that is if the creatinine goes up by that much, it's zero. Now, if you have a small cachectic female, it may only have to go up by 0.4 for her to have a GFR of zero. And so what I'm going to work on is I'm going, to, I'm going to, to take this information and I'm going to put it into an app. That's why I've hired some 25-year-olds because I can't figure that out. So the drug dosing book that we have, we're working on creating a, an app that you can carry around on your phone and it's going to include this information in it. So that's one of the important take-home messages for today. What can we do for these people? So the important thing is, you got the nephrologist here. He's leading the team. And he's going to give you an indication of what's going on. And in this case, he's telling me, there's a lobster under that rock. So he's using his hand signal to show there's a lobster. This, is, this happens to be my daughter swimming off in their own direction. So she's going to miss that. So she's the surgeon in this case. <laughs> and they're going off and doing whatever they're going to do. And uh, so what, what can we do? So when we talk about drug removal by chronic uh, therapies, there are two processes. There's the process of diffusion and convection. And we have, interestingly enough, set this up to maximize diffusion. And why, how do we do that? We do it through countercurrent flow. So blood enters the dialyzer in this direction, dialysate enters the, in this direction, so that we can maximize the diffusive gradient through the whole process. We can impact convection to a small effect in, in intermittent hemodialysis because we're pulling fluid off. So when a patient comes in, they may be up two to four kilos, so that means we have to pull out two to four liters of fluid. And when we pull that drug, or that, that water off, drug comes with it. So we have two processes. Um, the technical factors are uh, the membrane, not so much anymore. We have high flux membranes, they let everything through. That's why we have to use pure water, because if we don't use pure water, then uh, bacterial contaminants go into the body, and that's uh, typically a bad thing. Um, we can affect blood flow, dialysate flow, ultrafiltration rate, and time a little bit. The drug factors are molecular weight, protein binding, the charge, because the char if the drug has a charge, it's going to make the molecular size larger, make it harder to filter, and then volume distribution. If you have a drug that has a volume distribution of 1,000 liters, dialysis isn't going to help you if you have an acute toxicity. If you have a drug that has a volume distribution of 10 liters, dialysis will be very good if it's dialyzable. So here are, here are the two therapies I'm going to talk about. So uh, going back to our patient, case one, we could do intermittent hemodialysis. The nice thing about that is we have high blood flows, so it's going to have good clearance. High dialysate flow, it's going to have good clearance. We can impact ultrafiltration a little bit. We don't add replacement fluids, 
since we're not giving replacement fluids, we can't push this higher, but we don't leave them on very long. So most drug is removed by diffusion. What we, what we can do is SLED, sustained low efficiency dialysis, and this is the service that we provide here at the university hospital. And so uh, if you have a patient that has AKI and you want them on a continuous therapy, we can put them on SLED. The problem here is that we don't have high blood flows, we don't have high dialysate flow, ultrafiltration is, is fairly low, but we have time. So in intermittent hemodialysis in the dialysis facility that we have uh, coming down the street here shortly, we do four hours of treatment every 48 hours. With SLED, we do 24 hours of treatment every 24 hours. How does that impact drug removal? So in, circulate, in, in summary, the dosing rules. You want to give your dose almost always after the end of an intermittent therapy. So you're not dialyzed. If I give the dose at the beginning of dialysis, it can be dialyzed off during those four hours. So let's give the doses after. If we have a significant removal of an important drug, we need to give a small loading dose at the completion of dialysis. Uh, if the drug is not removed, then it almost doesn't matter when you give the drug, right? Uh, we need to estimate the removal for continuous therapies because we have a patient that has a, you think that they have a GFR of zero, but because of the continuous therapy, they may have a, a GFR uh, of 10, 15, 30. So we have to take that into account, and that often doesn't happen. If you can measure levels, avoid underdosing. So let's go back to our case one. Um, what antibiotic, what regimen, what form of renal replacement therapy, does renal failure affect dose and regimen selection, and does the form of renal replacement uh, therapy affect the, the, that dose selection? So here's our five drugs that they gave us. Percent excreted, they're all renally excreted. There's only one that has protein binding effect. Volume distributions are all small. So there's really not a lot of guidance here from a standpoint of which one to select. Forrest, what one would you select? Okay, meropenem. So let's see what, what the dose recommendation is for that. So if you go to the package insert, there are no dose recommendations whatsoever for any of these drugs. So, um, Eleanor talked about the drug book. So this is what the drug book that Aronoff has. And so for meropenin, it says to give one to two grams every 12 hours. Uh, the author, who is, uh, does continuous renal replacement therapies and drug selections for that, would recommend uh, something similar, one gram every eight hours. So that's the recommendation for uh, the treatment. And you can find all of these recommendations in a couple of different sources. And I'll show you at the end if we get there. Uh, what to do. So uh, this is the boyfriend. I tried to get the dive boat people to put 50 pounds of weight on him. They wouldn't do that. But I was watching out for him because he was swimming off in the wrong direction and we had to, we had to bring him back because he wasn't really paying a, attention. So uh, in summary, uh, drugs accumulate that are normally really excreted. We have, ex we have accumulation of both active and, and toxic metabolites. We have changes in drug distribution due to protein binding. We have decreased renal metabolism. For patients prescribing, ascertain the level of renal function. Ask yourself, what's that creatinine mean? A serum creatinine of one in an 18-year-old is not equivalent to a serum creatinine of one in a 60-year-old. Establish the integrity and nature of liver metabolism of the drug. Establish the loading dose based on the volume of distribution. The maintenance dose, we have to determine whether it's a dose reduction versus interval. Check for drug interaction. If you have nine drugs in a patient, the interaction, you have a 100% chance of there being an interaction. Decide whether blood level monitoring is indicated. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance constant dose versus varying interval versus constant interval and varying dose. And so here's a, here's a patient. Here's the effect. Here's the uh, reference group. This is the effect of doubling the half-life on that patient. So if the serum creatinine falls and the GFR changes, doubles the half-life. This is what's going to happen to those concentrations. Here's the dosage forms that you have available, 125, 50, 12.5. Which one of these are you going to give? None of them, right? Because it, you can't match it for changing the dose. So we're going to have to change the interval as well. So here is 
125 milligrams every 24 hours with the dotted line, and here's 125 every 12 hours. So that's why when the recommendation says give 125 every 12 to 24 hours, you have to make a decision. And the question is, do I want them to be a little bit higher than, than normal, or do I want them to be a little lower than normal? If this is a patient that has a serious gram-negative infection, you aren't going to choose this, right? I hope. You're going to choose this one. So that's why you have to think a little bit, a little bit about it, and the, the recommendations aren't exact at times. So in conclusion, renal prescribing is an art, not a science, although to me it's a science. Um, there's no substitute for knowing the drug's pharmacology in the individual patient. Individualized go low and go slow, although if we're talking about antibiotic dosing in patients on continuous renal, renal replacement therapy, the data show that we underdose dramatically. Um, review meds list using, uh, including over-the-counter supplements uh, at each visit because, once again, nine drugs, you're going to be guaranteed of some kind of interaction occurring. And so finally, when you come to the surface and you're wondering what to do, you hope the dive boat is at least on the horizon. Okay, and then finally, and then also, if you do want to, if you have a question, if you just type in, you don't have to type in KDP.net, if you type kdp.louisville.edu, on the left-hand side, there will be a, a, a thing for drug dosing in adults and children. And so you can use that off our website to, to uh, ask those questions. Or like I said, look for your dive master. The Jacobs is a dive master at University Hospital. Eleanor, everybody knows, she's our dive master. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Right. Yeah, uh, so despite what Eleanor said at the beginning, I'm not really a metabolism person, but um, uh, glucuronidation occurs quite a bit in the kidney. Uh, the impact of decreased renal function on that is, of course, associated with flow and delivery of the drug. So glucuronidation can be uh, purely impacted by delivery of drug to the site. And so that's going to be important in congestive heart disease. So the, the, the pump, every, everything is driven by the pump, right? So I don't want to make the cardiologist have a big head. But if the pump is bad, then every clearance is going to be decreased, right? So glucuronidation will be changed as well. Uh, I don't know of a specific uh, study where they looked at the uremic toxins and if it interferes, but it likely does because we've seen that it's interfering with these other ones. And this is an area that people haven't really studied that much. And so I, I, the, the kidney does metabolize. Uh, the other, the, the interesting one that George always told me was he had a diabetic patient, their renal function is decreasing, and they say, my diabetes is cured. Well, their diabetes wasn't cured. The insulin half-life has become so long that they no longer need exogenous insulin. Yeah, so this other, this global RPH, that talks about the uh, interactions a lot. Um, the, the biggest uh, impact 
on, on drug dosing that I know of is grapefruit juice and its interference with cytochrome P450 enzyme and uh, patients that are on uh, like uh, uh, calcineurin inhibitor and they, they change the bioavailability. And uh, one of the um, examples that we talked, that Jacobs and I talked about was azithromycin, right? So that has a bioavailability of 0.38. So if you change the bioavailability a little bit by taking something that interferes with metabolism in the first path of it, the, you could increase the drug concentration by, by twofold. That's what happens with cyclosporin. Plus you, you have the impact of the P-glycoprotein, which is the transporter that moves drugs into, into the body. Those things all can change. So it's complex. And I think a lot of times you have a positive effect and you have a negative effect, so you don't see the effect because you have one going one way and one going the other. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, the, the data show that obesity is not, uh, uh, doesn't influence those, those, those numbers. Uh, what, what would be nice would be, and we've thought about this. It, uh, creatinine doesn't really, creatinine doesn't, doesn't really uh, 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 go into the body fat that much, so it's, it's not going to impact it. Um, what would be cool would be to, to go across the street in Raid McLean's lab where they have the the bioimpedance machine and get some uh, measurements of lean body mass to see if that's more uh, more important. But when you look at a patient, my what my advisor at Purdue said, he, he liked Herschel Walker, so maybe he's not the best example right now. But if you look at Herschel Walker and you look at just, you know, somebody walk on the street, they're when you look at creatinine, they're very different. That equation treats them all to this regression to the mean in a way. So when you look at somebody, if you have somebody who has that's a weightlifter and they're on creatine and they're taking creatine, so their serum creatinine isn't going to be a great indicator of what their their GFR is. And so you have to make some allowances for that. You're going to say this serum creatinine is going to be higher with a normal renal function. So you might, which is great because Jacobs is always looking for new patients in our dialysis unit. Uh, but uh, you, you have to take that into account as well. So um, African Americans have more muscle mass than Caucasians on average. Females have less muscle mass on average than males, except in East Germany during the Olympics in the 1970s. <laughs> so <clears throat> all those things have to be taken into account. They did the best that they could.
Nope, I'm good. Thank you. 